Welcome back to the Instrumentarium Podcast. I am your host, Brett Newton, from Bandistration.com, and with me, as always, is Matthew Banks. Hey there, folks. And today we'd like to discuss uh, a rare member of the saxophone family, the bass saxophone. Matt, you had any experience with bass saxes before? I have not. I have heard them, but I have never seen one. I've played more contrabass saxophones than I've played basses. <laughs> really? Um, I've played two bass saxophones. My undergrad had one and my grad school had one. I've seen them used a few times other than that. Uh, and I, you know, I write for them in my compositions. Uh, so it looks like I've got a little bit more experience than you do. Uh, you want to start talking about, uh, well, I guess we probably should start talking about what is a bass saxophone. A lot of people, when they talk about the bass member of the saxophone family, are actually referring to the baritone sax. The baritone sax in a sax quartet usually takes the role of the bass, uh, but it's not the bass member of the family. There is one bigger, it's the bass sax. It's in B-flat, one octave below the tenor sax. Yes, indeed, and it was the original saxophone that Adolf Sax created. Right, and so let's talk about that original instrument. The original saxophone, the first one Adolf Sax ever built, was a bass saxophone in the key of C. Uh, we have some idea about this instrument, it was keyed down to low B, which would sound the B just below the bass clef. And Sax was able to play about three octaves on it. So it would go up to uh, C5, the C within the treble clef. Uh, it had, we think it had double octave keys, which would make it a little easier to get up to those high notes. And this is the first saxophone that people heard. He built it in the 1840s, we don't know the exact date he built of that particular instrument. Um, it is rumored that that instrument still exists. It's in a private collection in France, uh, but no photos of it have emerged. Uh, we don't know exactly what it sounds like. Um, from what I understand, it's in a state of disrepair. It's not able to be used, but it does exist we think well we have i've seen you posted on your blog like on the saxophone article and then later in the bass saxophone uh subcategory uh video of someone playing a c bass saxophone by sax right yes that's the miller robe uh bass in c it's the only other surviving bass saxophone in c and it really feels substantially different than the modern bass saxophones. It's a very uh, light and compact instrument. Again, it only goes down to a written B, which sounds the B below the bass clef. Uh, its proportions are very close to a baritone sax. Uh, the bell is not much larger than a modern tenor saxophone's bell. So it's a much more compact instrument. And Chances are that the original sax was like this as well. Uh, the other thing, the original sax probably was shaped like an ophicleide. Uh, it, it generally in bassoon shape, not in the curved uh, bass clarinet style that we see in the other saxophone sizes. Yes, that makes some sense for the instrument length, and especially if the instrument wasn't well, if it was designed to be more compact rather than large bored and full throated like our modern instruments. Right, and we can see this in Sax's original patent. Uh, the patent shows eight sizes of saxophone. The only one shown in detail is the bass, and it is in ophicleide shape. Uh, there are two sizes bigger a contrabass and a subcontrabass. He illustrates only in an outline, and they again are in bigger off the Clyde shape, whereas the baritone and on up had the traditional look that we envisioned the saxophones having. Only the bass on down had a different size. Uh, there were, incidentally, some baritone saxes made in the, uh, the off the Clyde shape. They were called, uh, I believe they're called Georgiaphones. 
uh, they're sometimes mistakenly uh, shown as ba- uh, baritone saxes in F, but they're not. They are in E flat. They're just at high pitch, so it's almost uh, a baritone sax in E, but not quite. Uh, so they could mistake it as a F baritone made for someone in Eastern Europe who turns to 420 or something. <laughs> no, not not that low. It would. Um, oh. An F at 420? Yeah. No, because that... Yeah, about that. Well, you know, I'm just spit... Kind of spitballing to figure out how someone could justify calling it an F, you know? True. I mean, a lot of people... uh, Well, if you look at it on the size, you can see it is physically smaller because, again, it only goes down to B, whereas modern baritones go down to A. um, And it's in uh, a bassoon shape. So it looks smaller, it handles smaller. It's only about the length of a tenor. Ah, gotcha. So let, let's go back to Adolf Sachs's first bass. And I'm going to read something. It's uh, from the composer Hector Berlioz, who was good friends with sax. Uh, incidentally, he never used the sax in any of his surviving compositions. There is one piece, the Chant Sacre, that uh, the arrangement of it he used a bass saxophone in, but that arrangement has since been lost. This is Berlioz's uh, quote from 1849. And remember, when he's talking about the saxophone here, he is referring to the bass sax. At this time, it's really the only sax that's been built. The tone of the saxophone bridges the gap between the brass and the woodwind, but it also suggests, more remotely, the tone of the strings. In my view, the principal advantage of is the great variety and beauty of its different expressive capabilities. Sometimes low and calm, then passionate, dreamy, or melancholy. Sometimes tender, like an echo, or like the vague plaintive sigh of the wind in the branches or like the strange fading vibrations of a bell only after it has been struck. I know of no other instrument that possesses this particular capacity to reach the outer limits of audible sound. The only sounds that can give any idea of the saxophone's delicious half-tense and its suggestions of fading twilight are the diminuendo and piano of the cantors of the Russian Imperial Chapel, those wonderful singers who must make the good Lord envious of Tsar Nicholas. If they were applied to the skillful performance of some inspired poetic piece, these saxophone sounds would plunge the listener into an ecstatic state, which I can imagine, but cannot possibly attempt to describe. Wow. That's an incredible uh, statement of praise. It baffles me, then, that he never used it in his compositions. He didn't. And, again, 1849, so Berlioz is toward the end of his composition career he's actually getting a little bit more uh reserved in his compositions um the only time he came close to using it is i believe in the final scene of the damnation of faust in his manuscript there are two staves marked for bass saxophone and tenor saxophone in e flat that were supposed to be part of the final scene. Now, when he wrote tenor saxophone in E flat, he actually means uh, baritone in E flat. The tenor saxophone was actually the last sax that Adolf Sax built. So the uh, nomenclature for the family emerged as it was being constructed, is what you're saying, kind of. Right. Um, so the the term baritone came a little bit later. And I think you can see this in other instruments. The term baritone really isn't used in a, a lot of other instrument families. You know, you go soprano, alto, tenor, bass. And it was pretty simple. Uh, but really, 
the term baritone as a voice for instruments comes about with Adolf Sax. You've got the baritone sax. You've got the the baritone sax horn, which is our modern baritone horn. And any other instruments that fall under the the baritone category, baritone sarusophone, uh, whatnot, uh, really are uh, can trace their lineage back to sax. So he kind of creates the concept of a distinct band voice between the tenor and the bass. Right, right. And you look back at uh, recorders, it goes soprano, alto, tenor, bass, great bass, contrabass. Well, if you rename the bass as baritone, then the great bass, which is kind of a silly name, becomes bass, and then contrabass. Makes a little bit more sense, and you don't have to worry about the term great bass. After Sax made his first instrument in C, his first bass saxophone, sorry, he didn't make very many FC instruments. Uh, your list involved like... Uh, seven. Eight. Seven. Yeah, seven. He only, uh, as far as extant instruments go, we only know of, uh, I believe... Uh, no, it's, it's a little bit more than seven. I think it's like 11 instruments made in F and C. And so the, the, the original C bass was a prototype. All basses that came after that were in B flat, one tone lower. So only two C bass saxophones, as far as we know, have ever been made. That's the original sax and the, the Milero. No one since has made one. It, um, oh, I take that back. Benedict Eppelsheim made one, but that's almost outside of the category because the bass sax in C he made is such a, is of such a narrow bore that uses uh, an alto sax mouthpiece. So it's almost a different class of instrument. Well, you discussed it a little bit in your FC saxophone uh, myth versus reality post, but what do you think's the reason sax moved away from making these uh, FNC instruments? Because they would be ideal for playing in bands and orchestras. Uh, there's probably a few theories about it. I mean, I think very quickly sax found that the military bands were much more welcoming of him than the orchestras. The orchestras really didn't want to have anything to do with him. Adolf Sachs was kind of a jerk. Uh, he, a genius, but he was hard to get along with. So, because the majority of the French band instruments were in B-flat and E-flat, his saxophones, therefore, were in B-flat and E-flat. All right. Yeah, that makes some sense. And then when orchestras wanted to use them, they used the military band instruments. The idea of uh, two separate sets of saxophones is largely, largely a myth. Uh, we don't get uh, F and C saxophones really until the the 1910s and 1920s. I understand. All right, so let's get back to bass sax. The actual first person to compose for the bass saxophone was, is an obscure composer named George Kastner. Uh, Kastner um, worked with the French military bands, um, and the first piece uh, to use saxophone is called... The Last King of Judah. It's a cantata, he wrote, and it's probably never been performed since its premiere in the 1840s, but it does contain a part for bass saxophone in C. Uh, Kastner also wrote several other uh, pieces that involved it, um, but again, almost none have been performed. Uh, what Kastner did do, though, is he, um, even before Berlioz was writing instrumentation texts, orchestration manuals, he actually has, is known for two. There's his um, instrument or orchestration text from, I want to say it's 1837. It predates the Berlioz text by a few years. And he also has uh, a... Uh, orchestration text for military bands for a few years after the Berlioz text. And it's that text that we get the bulk of our information about early saxophones and early saxophone scoring from. The first edition of that in 
includes 14 sizes of saxophone. By the last edition of that text uh, in, in the 1850s, it gets down to our modern understanding of saxophones being primarily B-flat and E-flat instruments. So within the first decade of the saxophone being uh, patented and made, the idea of F and C instruments goes away, and we can see within the text that they're just not there anymore. Now, going back to the B-flat bass, using your uh, vast knowledge of uh, orchestral lit, or band lit, if you will, can you give us a, a time or a piece where we first encounter the B-flat bass being scored for explicitly? B-flat bass sax in an orchestral piece? Um, no, I can't. And I'm trying to think of a single piece that uses B-flat bass sax. Uh, yes, it's going to have to be uh, Joseph Holbrook. Uh, there, I believe, The Children of Dawn. And it's got to be about 1908. It, Joseph Holbrook is a really obscure English composer. Uh, he had the, the nickname The Cockney Wagner. A composer you do not hear a lot anymore. Uh, his big compositions are really unperformed. We don't know what they sound like unless you can score read. They are on IMSLP. Um, his big claim to fame is a lot of the pieces he wrote are quoted in the Forsyth Orchestration Treatise. Um, otherwise... I, th I really think that's probably the first time we, we see B-flat bass sax in an orchestral situation. Yes, I'm familiar with that excerpt. I perused Holbrook stuff when I uh, looked through the force with text. And uh, he uses a whole family of saxophones, I think, from soprano down to bass. Right, so he has a soprano, alto, tenor, and bass in there. And all are integral to the, the scoring. Yes, Holbrook, kind of like Delius we discussed uh, last podcast, I think is a little underrated. My perfect pitch gives me a special window for viewing scores, and a lot of his stuff is interesting, really interesting. I I've listened to some of the stuff that uh, Naxos and Marco Polo have put out, um, but the, the stuff that's got the real orchestral and orchestration gems in it has not been done. Uh, the stuff that, that has the saxophones, and in, in particular, I want to hear some of the stuff with the sarusophones in it, has, has never been recorded. Wow. Of course it hasn't. You know, the, the piece Apollo and the Seaman has been performed twice, and I believe those are in like 1909, 1911. And it's famous because it was the first uh, piece of multimedia. You know, it had a slideshow to go with the symphony which is unheard of at the time, but, you know, we take it for granted today. And he's just kind of forgotten in the, uh, well, not just in the British composer lexicon, but in the 20th century in general. Oh, absolutely. All right, so let's get back to, to bass saxophones. Let's talk about, um, really, the golden age of bass saxophones is the 1920s. And it's the golden age of all saxophones, but this is really the time when we see bass saxophones getting used a lot more. They're the bottom instruments of a lot of jazz bands. And most people's introduction to bass saxophone is through jazz, as it is with any size of saxophone. And one of the reasons they would use bass saxophone is that the recording equipment at the time couldn't pick up a string bass. So they had to use a wind instrument, a bass saxophone or tuba, on the recording equipment. So a lot of those early recordings you'll hear will have a bass saxophone on it. The, the big name of that is Adrian Rolini. And Rolini it was the master of the bass saxophone. You ever heard any Rolini before? Yes, I have. He has such a beautiful, creamy sound, especially when he... Uh plays melodies in that register, you know? Yeah, and, and sadly, after the, the 1920s and into the 1930s, he stopped playing bass saxophone entirely. He went to playing 
I think he went to playing vibraphone. Yeah, that sounds about right, which is bizarre. I can't imagine abandoning that instrument. It just wasn't in favor. It didn't fit in with the the more aggressive style that was going on in the big bands. What an unfortunate casualty. Well, you know, Duke Ellington also used bass saxophone until, like, uh, 1934. Then he had his bass saxophonist to switch over to lead alto. But, yeah, it fell out of favor. Yeah, and the only other um, time you'll see bass saxophone in, in a big jazz setting is, I have seen it in Stan Kenton ensembles. In fact, I actually saw a touring Stan Kenton group, and uh, they had two Barry players, and one of them would switch over to, to bass sax and had, had both of them with them. Ah, uh, yes. Well, and Kent, that would have, I'm guessing that was Kenton's mellophonium period, too when he had the four mellophones added to his brass section. I think there was some of that in there, yeah, where he tried to really expand the jazz band. Which, you know, I'm in favor of. It's it's an interesting sound. Well, so the bass saxophone is introduced in jazz, but one Percy Granger used it before the jazz age, I think, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, it was in use uh, pretty regularly in band music. And... You look, you look at the saxophones, going back probably to the 1890s, you're going to see saxophones in the, the bands, the military bands in particular. And bass saxophone was there. It was used. You see bass saxophones in the Sousa band. In fact, if anybody has the copy of Alfred Blatter's um, Instrumentation and Orchestration, the bass saxophone picture in that book was John Philip Sousa's bass saxophone. So we know the Sousa band used it. Gilmore, before him, used it quite extensively. And of course, as you said, Percy Granger used it. But not as extensively as you might think. Um, in I've got a handful of Granger scores, and it's only in two of the big pieces. It's only in Lincolnshire and Children's March. Ah, uh, that's a shame, but... In both of those pieces, it has a fairly uh, significant part, right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, the other two I've got, I've got um, Colonial Song and uh, uh, Molly on the Shore, and neither of those have bass saxophone parts in it. That's unfortunate. Well, I'd love to do some more research and see if he used it anywhere else, because Granger was a huge advocate for the saxophone, and I'm certain he would have gladly used it whenever possible you dick oh yeah uh, he used used it quite quite extensively i just uh he was much more in favor of the soprano sax than he was you know the bass sax i, I mean th- don't get me wrong he advocated for a full family and he wrote about this extensively saying it doesn't make sense to leave out soprano and bass you don't do that in a choir why do it in a band so what kind of function Using those two uh, scores, uh, Children's March and uh, Lincolnshire, does Granger give to the B-flat bass saxophone? Well, I just happen to have um, Lincolnshire within reach. Um, and I've turned to the fourth movement of Lincolnshire. And he really has it as um, the lowest voice of the woodwind ensemble. Uh, along with uh, contrabassoon. Um, he gives a lot of the, the solo stuff here to the berry sax, but he'll use the bass sax to reinforce it an octave lower. You know, and he goes within this movement all the way right down to the written low B. Um, it makes no bones about doing that in 16th note runs. So you, know, you see what are difficult parts on it. Really, I, the, I, for me, the, the quintessential bass saxophone part is in the sixth movement where there's a part where the bass saxophone comes in. It's really one of the only instruments playing the bass line, uh, bass saxophone and tubas. And it really puts a nice edge on that bass, on that bass line. Very much so. You, you showed me a great recording where I caught it, and it's like, a, gra- a gravelly-voiced king speaking up loudly, you know? 
In fact, I, I like how you mentioned that, a gravelly voice king. In my first orchestral piece, I did a setting of the Epic of Gilgamesh. And the voice of Gilgamesh in the first movement, where he is a terrible, tyrannical king, I put that on a solo bass saxophone, and I just have it rip the main melody of it. You know, and as as the piece gets on, it softens and the bass saxophone goes off. But you know, I've got that big solo bass saxophone there in early orchestral piece of mine. That's beautiful, man. That that suits the instrument's voice very well. It, it's kingly, it's stately, but it's not. Uh, it's a gruff king. It's it's very much Odin, father of Thor. Oh, yes. Have you written any uh, tone poems in the uh, Norse mythology yet? That's a great scoring technique, you know? Um, well, that, that's kind of what uh, the Alfheim Symphony is. It is uh, Alfheim is uh, a place in Norse mythology. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. I've actually read a little bit about it. That's cool. One important thing you said in Lincolnshire is that he uses the bass saxophone, and that lets him free up the baritone saxophone to be a baritone-voiced instrument rather than be the bass. Right, yeah, and the baritone functions beautifully in its mid to upper register. You know, we always think about the baritone being this low, punchy voice, but up in, in its high register, it's a beautiful singing voice. That's the bass, let the bass saxophone take care of that punchy bass stuff yes the bass saxophone the the best term is sings like it sings in the money range from f3 to a flat four like that's where it's home and where no other instrument can really match that timbre okay got a quiz for you do you know what the most famous bass saxophone solo of all time is the one that most people have heard before No, I do not. The sound that most people will automatically recognize as being a bass saxophone. Do you ever watch The Muppet Show? Absolutely. (laughs) The theme song to The Muppet Show features bass saxophone. In fact, the last note of The Muppet Show theme is a low A flat from the bass sax. Just clear bottom note of the bass sax. And that way you can you really know it's a bass. So millions and millions of kids didn't know that, but they've been initiated into uh, the bass saxophone cult by that low A flat. Right. So, you know, you've got that, that wonderful, rich, low A flat. The, the problem with modern bass saxophone writing is the instrument is not seen a lot. You said yourself personally you've never actually seen a bass saxophone yet oddly enough you've played contrabass so there's that um the bass saxophone within band music really started to die out by about the 1940s Uh, this could be partly due to economics it could be due to other constraints you know the soprano sax nearly died out until some jazz players started taking it up uh, but nobody really ever came to take up the cause of the bass sax, and it slowly started to fade away. Um, makers weren't making them really anymore. In the 1920s, 1930s, you've got Kahn and Selmer both producing their bass sax, which incidentally is uh, the, the two instruments from the two different companies have the exact same body, just different key work. So they're going to sound exactly the same. They just may be mechanically a little different. Gotcha. Uh, otherwise, you you get to the 1960s, 1970s, you get the Selmer, the Mark VI bass, and it becomes kind of the bass of choice. They redesign it to make it a little bit more compact, a little bit shorter, uh, and a little easier to use. And you've got that instrument, and you've got the Kyle Worth being made up until about 10 years ago. And those are the only two companies producing a bass sax, and the price is exorbitant. You know, $20,000 for a Selmer bass sax. 
Well, along comes the, the manufacturer, Benedict Eppelsheim, who is uh, an engineering genius. He develops his own new bass saxophone in a completely different style that pretty much blows the other instruments out of the water. It's also cheaper than the Selmer. Go figure. A handmade instrument, less expensive than the factory-made instrument. That's a fantastic oxymoron. I like it. <laughs> it is. I mean, given the chance, always go with Eppelsheim. I think I'll have to. Now, I wonder if part of the bass saxophone disappearing from the band may be its range. It's a half contra as opposed to a full contra, correct? Right. So I define half contra as instruments whose lowest note is around G1. The lowest note of the bass sax is A flat 1, half a step below that. A full contra is an instrument that's lowest note is around C1. Uh, so that would be the contrabass saxophone. So bass saxophone doesn't go as low as some of the other contrabass instruments. It's basically equivalent to the contra alto clarinet in its range. Contra alto clarinet will go down a step below. Um, but more and more, composers are going toward the contrabass clarinet in B flat because it has that extended range. We don't really have that with the bass sax. You could go with a contrabass sax, but they're so extremely rare that it's never going to happen. And a great deal more expensive. <laughs> um, you know, it's not, really. Um, from what I've seen, the Eppelsheim uh, bass is 15,000 pounds, which... You know, that's the, the one site I've seen dealing them, which is, as the pound has gone down the tubes, is about $16,000. The Eppelstein Contrabass is twenty. It's a, a 5,000 dif- uh, pound, uh, about $6,000 difference. Uh, not that huge, considering. Actually, that's amazing, Brett. Like... The Selmer 41 contrabass clarinet, the modern standard for B flat contras, is 31 to 38 grand right now, depending on who you talk. And their contra alto is 16 grand. And that, that's the MSRP. That's the suggested retail price. That's not what you're actually going to get it for. You could get the, the Selmer 41 for 25. I know what you mean, the MSR rate. But at any rate, like, the B-flat contrabass saxophone that Benedict Eppelsheim makes... The E-flat is contrabass of, sax, not... E-flat, sorry, sorry. Um, is of comparable price, or lower, than a full-range, low-C, B-flat contrabass clarinet by Selmer. Right. So he's making these phenomenal instruments, and they're, they are, they're not astronomically priced you know and, and you know uh, speaking of apple shine he also produces a, a contrabass clarinet as well uh, i have not seen the price on that though and it's supposed to be equally as good as the selmer fantastic that, that needs to be investigated all alternatives to the selmer that add some variety to the contrabass pool i heartily endorse you know yeah the selmers are just ungodly expensive well and I got a chance to play on one at a colloquium, a clarinet colloquium that A&M Commerce put on a year ago. And comparing that to my experience on the old LeBlanc paperclip, sure, it can play louder, but other than that, there's not much advantage. Uh, when I was at TCU, we had one, and you know, I was the bassoonist, contrabassoonist there, and I spent several days days trying to adjust the B-flat contra clarinet. Uh, The thing is a nightmare to keep an adjustment. I don't know if it ever got into full adjustment. I believe it. Now, contrast that to my uh, school's LeBlanc. It's a paperclip, and according to my school's uh, old bassoon teacher who has been there for 50 years now, it was purchased before he got there. They don't have to take it into the shop, and it just stays in adjust. Go figure, right? Yeah, that that was a really a great design. It's a shame they don't produce it anymore. But it, it does seem we've strayed a bit from bass saxophone. 
We're very good at that. We're yeah, very we good are, at that. We are. Uh, so let, let's bring it back in. Let's. I want to talk about uh, some bass saxophone technique. Uh, first thing is uh, saxophone players don't pick up the bass saxophone with the same kind of ease that they will of the other saxophones. Number one... 90% of the time, they're going to be dealing with one of the old vintage instruments from the 20s or 30s. Uh, this means that the instruments are only keyed up to high E flat. Uh, anything above E flat is going to have to be taken as an altissimo. Uh, second, it doesn't have the um, articulated G sharp. The, the, bells are, the, the bell keys are on opposite sides of the bell. And the other thing, and this is the real big problem with the old vintage bass saxophones, is uh, the octave key D doesn't work very well. Uh, the, the bigger the instrument, the more octave vents it needs. And the, the old vintage basses just don't have the vent for the D in the right place. The, the trick to this is use the palm key D as the octave vent. And it works pretty well, but it's incredibly awkward. It almost sounds like these instruments were created in a transitional phase before the single octave key system was standardized and the saxophone would have worked better with two dedicated octave keys, you know? Um, in, in this case, the, the, the bass sax, because of its size, actually needs three. It's got to have one more vent, and it's got to have a vent specifically for the D, D and D sharp. And you see this uh, in instruments of the size range. Surprisingly, Khan uh, knew this beforehand, and when they uh, developed their uh, contrabass sarusophone, there are three vent keys, and one of the vent keys is specifically for that D. It's operated by the, the right thumb. It's the only right thumb key on the Econ Sarusophone. Uh, so something like that should be incorporated into the, ba the bass saxophone's octave mechanism, but it never was. And this uh, trend held over into the Selmer basses. The Selmer basses uh, D in the staff is still the, a weak note. So there are there's some design flaws in it. Uh, by the way, Appleshim fixed this on his instrument. He has enough octave vents. In fact, I think he has extra octave vents, uh, including an altissimo vent, to take the instrument up even higher. So I think there might be a corollary to why the bass saxophone fell out of favor, because if design flaws like this are that common, or as you're saying, standard. It becomes a liability to use an instrument in a band setting, especially if it doesn't work. And it, this, the, the corollary here is to the alto clarinet that we talked about um, a few weeks back. That there are there were some design flaws. It's not the most user friendly instrument. It's also an instrument you don't want to have around your neck. It after a while it does hurt to play and it can cause some some neck damage if you play it for a long period of time. It's a heavy instrument. Absolutely, that kind of instrument requires, I believe, a harness, or they. Uh, I think you can get a dedicated uh, stand, like a stand that you can play into and leave the sax in. Right, it's the the Hamilton stands, and I I saw some the other day and. You know, they're, they're priced fairly well, but, you know, a little bit flimsy, and it doesn't offer you the, the same mobility. Um, the, the newer saxes, including the Appleshine, now have pegs on them, like a bass clarinet, which is really a, a smart move. Absolutely, because even if you have a good harness on, that instrument is being held in place by the right hand, and that right hand's going to tire out very quickly. Uh, very much so. Uh, so let's talk um, bass saxophone in modern day compositions. Um, of course, it's not seen very often in orchestra. I myself have used it in a couple of my orchestral pieces. Um, of course, I mentioned earlier my Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, it's really an early student piece. I don't claim it. There's also a, a movement from a symphony I never finished. Surprisingly, both of those pieces got performed, um, at least read through. <laughs> and so, but, and I had bass saxophone there for both of them, um, but 
you know, not it probably not something that'll get repeated. Um, I do use bass saxophone a lot in my my band compositions. Um, the piece I'm working on right now, The Forest of Dreams, has a prominent bass saxophone part as well as full family of saxophones. I've um, used it. Uh, first band piece that I used it in was a piece called The Black Mass, and there's uh, a big part toward the end that really needs the the bottom notes of the bass sax to really punch through. Absolutely. You told me this funny story once about you wrote a uh, romance for bass saxophone and strings, and uh, at the premiere, the bass saxophone fell apart? It wasn't at the premiere. It was the day of or the day before the premiere, the day before my recital. The bell of the bass saxophone literally fell off the instrument and was not usable. And I had to last minute retranscribe it. I transcribed it for bassoon. I pl- played the bassoon part, and uh, the performance was a, a complete disaster because I had to conduct and play at the same time, and it just. Bleh. Um, I am still waiting to hear that piece played on uh, a bass saxophone as written. Gotcha. That's very unfortunate. My goodness. Yeah, I, we knew the bass saxophone at UTA had some issues. The brace holding on just, you know, stopped working. It it, it came undone. It, it was not a good body to bell brace. It was a, a poor design. It was just a single metal wire holding that huge toilet bowl sized bell to the body. And it just couldn't take the stress. I, again, just a, a poor design. My goodness. Well, I think the bass, the bass saxophone lends itself very well as being part of the low brass choir. Like, I could see it matching the bass trombone's grit in that register. Yes, you know? ba- bass saxophone plus bass trombone will get a real monster, meaty sound. You know, it's something that you could really see in um, a big 1960s jazz band. You know, you have this big, you know, trombone, bass trombone part with all these pedals. When you double that with bass sax, man, that's going to be an awesome sound. But conversely, in the, the middle and upper register, I can really see it supporting a horn choir. It's particularly at a lower dynamic. I was actually just thinking that, yes. I haven't heard enough to ver. I haven't heard enough bass saxophone playing really lyrically to verify it, but I think... In its upper register, a lot like the uh, baritone saxophone, it sings just in the bass range. You know, you don't want to take the bass saxophone up really too high because, you know, it's going to lose some of its characteristic sound. But remember, all saxophones are really meant to function within about that two octave range. The stuff below the staff is extended. The stuff above the staff is extended. But within that nice two octave range from C to C... Everything really should sound absolutely beautiful. Yes. Bass saxophone, like I brought up the brass, low brass choir especially, because the bass saxophone, thanks to its power and its presence, could give some relief to a tuba section and add a lot of variety to the powerful low end of the band. Yes, uh, and it can really free the, the, the tubas from the woodwind section as well you know it can provide almost the the uh tuba sound for the woodwinds and with enough power to carry the whole woodwind section now what would what woodwind instruments like other than other saxophones which it'll naturally blend with do you think it'll blend with best uh you know first thing comes to my mind is if you put the bass saxophone in its upper register, it'll actually pair should pair really nicely with English horn or bass oboe. It'd be a really fantastic combination. Um, I mean, really, the the standard part, the, what you're going to standard here is you know, with the contra clarinets, with the contra bassoon, even with second bassoon, a bass clarinet, and barry sax to form. A mass of sound down at the bottom of the the ensemble. Very much so. I I remember in Children's March that last phrase that da 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 da. That's all two bassoons and baritone saxophones. 
but when the bassoons go down to the low C and B flat, the bass saxophone takes over. And in the recordings where they use it, it's just awesome. Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, you've got the, the contrabassoon doing that as well, which actually Granger didn't write for contrabassoon. He wrote for uh, contrabass sarusophone. He didn't have the, the contrabassoon at the time. Well, a contrabass sarusophone would add even more punch to that line. It's the punchiest woodwind instrument you're going to find. Uh, I used to play it pretty extensively in undergrad, and I could outplay an entire 150-piece band, no problem. Do you have any audio of, of you playing it? Um, I don't. I, the, in order to do it, I would have to go up to UTA. I'd have to transfer the the recordings. And I might could do that. I might could arrange that to get me done. I'd, I'd love to be able to do that. I used it on several concerts, uh, not only just my own recitals, but I we didn't have a contrabassoon, so I just filled in the contrabassoon parts on sarusophone. Even something like Beethoven's Fifth Symphony I played on sarusophone. Wow, that's a that sounds like a trip, but I, I bet it provided more power than... Uh... Any bassoonist other than Arlen Faust or Mr. Lipnick could provide, you know? Oh, yeah. And actually, at that time, when I did the, the Beethoven 5 on Sarusa, when I was using a single reed mouthpiece. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, all right. So, bass saxophone thoughts. Um, what do you, uh, I'll, I'll throw this one out to you. What do you think about bass saxophone in the orchestra? In the orchestra? Really, the orchestra has only used the contrabassoon in terms of low-register woodwind instrument, So it could free that up. The saxophones in general, I think, blend better with strings than any other woodwind instrument. What do you think? Uh, I agree with that. Um, you know, as long as the, you know, the saxophones are not playing really aggressively, they could blend into the strings far better than any of the woodwinds do. The saxophones are a great blending instrument. Um... You know, I think I, I saw someone say once that um, of all the saxophones, the bass saxophone really should have a permanent spot in the orchestra. It adds that extra low sound to the woodwinds don't really have. It can blend the brass and the strings. I, I could see just, you know, even a single bass sax adding to an orchestra, a really an interesting dimension. Very much so. I think... Especially, and this might be an odd combination, but the bass saxophone with three trombones. Yes, that'd be Would just really, be a tremendous sound. That'd be a, yeah, tr- tremendous I think is a good word for it. it. It could become a very malevolent sound. My goodness, yes. Well, it's interesting how good some of these low instruments are at being malevolent. I wonder if a lot of that is just our, our cultural influence that we always associate low instruments with a, a darker, more malevolent sound. Um, that, that probably goes back uh, at least to Richard Wagner, where you know he's got the contrabass tuba representing the dragon. Ah, yes. Well, and thanks to film scoring in the 20s, all being copying from Ritchie's book, it, it makes sense. The bass saxophone... Though, of the woodwinds, you know, the sarusophone's the king of malevolent power, you know? Yes. Of being sinister. But those are hard to come by. Benedict Eppelsheim has made some custom ones. But the bass saxophone's much more available, and thus much more usable for that function. Am I right? Yes, and I think for a solo role... Or even and it's an addition to, you know, like you said, trombones or even low horns. I think that it's a fantastic combination. And that's not just for orchestra, that's for band as well. Oh, yes. Well, in a band, in coordination with a pair of contra clarinets and the contra bassoon, that'll provide the uh, lower foundation the band so badly needs in the woodwind section. Yes. You don't see it very often. And actually, um, I was uh, looking today, and you'll you'll be very happy to know this. I was looking at uh, some pictures from a Dallas Wind Symphony rehearsal, and they showed the low wind section: two bassoons, contrabassoon, 
Bass clarinet, contra alto clarinet, two alto clarinets, bass tuba, contra bass tuba, two string basses. Oh, goodness. Yeah, th- that's that's a well-balanced uh, low-end section. Partic- I was really surprised with the, the presence of two alto clarinets. Oh, absolutely. That's almost unheard of. You're lucky if you get one in a professional ensemble, and only when they're doing Lincolnshire Posey, you yeah, know? Right. Um, so, uh, in, in band music... Uh, I know of a single piece of modern band music within the the standard repertoire now that calls for bass saxophone. Uh, David Maslanka's Eighth Symphony. Uh, It's one of his more recent symphonies. It's it's under 10 years old. It's his biggest symphony by far. It does have a part for bass saxophone in it. Uh, Aside from that, I don't know of many modern pieces calling for bass sax. Have you uh, seen one? I have not. Um, I've heard whispers that... uh, Who's that guy? John Mackey. John Mackey has been thinking about using the instrument in a couple of pieces he slated to write in 2017. But other than that... It's really just not very commonly written for right now. It's it's not. Um, although you know, there's really become lately a, a much greater interest in the instrument. I think we're kind of in, in an era where people want to try these instruments again and say, "Hey, we've got these instruments sitting here. We need somebody to play it." Uh, you know, particularly at a university level, with where they have a lot of saxophonists. To provide, uh, you know, an extra part in the band for another player, not necessarily a bad thing. You're going to get more people involved. Very much so. And I know the bass saxophone is getting a bit of a resurgence in saxophone choir music. Yes, and you're seeing a lot more saxophone choir stuff these days. Uh, You see a lot of it being put on YouTube and a lot of it getting some really high praise. Oh, yes. Well, they'll use such large ensembles with varied instruments. Like, I particularly love that recording of the uh, F mezzo-soprano saxophone playing the English horn solo in Symphony Fantastique, and it sounds so close to the English horn. It really does. It really does. And in that ensemble, in the saxophone ensemble, it's either the lowest voice, or if they're lucky enough to have a contra, which is probably two extant groups. It's an important glue between the contra and the baritone saxophone. The, the more instruments you have down there, the fuller the ensemble's going to sound, the better the ensemble's going to sound, the richer the ensemble is going to sound. And there's no reason not to score for it if you have the instrument available. I have heard whispers that uh, Dr. Beatty, the saxophone teacher at A&M Commerce, is a uh, petitioning to get one for the school saxophone choir which could only be a good thing for commerce <laughs> oh yeah and you know puts a, put some rumors in his ear to to get an apple shine oh yes well that does bring me to one interesting option uh i the, think uh, i know where you're wh- going here the wessex bass saxophone um <laughs> And the, to be clear on that, West, it's, Wessex does not make the instrument. These are, are Chinese-made instruments. Uh, particularly, uh, that instrument comes out of the, the Jinbao factory in China. It, I, I, and I knew where you go, and I've got that the Wessex site brought up. Um, Wessex uh, imports tubas, but for whatever reason, they've got a bass saxophone there, and their bass saxophone is priced brand new, under five thousand dollars that's you know just ridiculously cheap for one of those instruments yes that's a set of our that's two r13s like there's no reason to not get a bass saxophone if it's a good instrument and it's that price uh yeah you know that's under the price of uh most baritone saxophones you know when i was doing some pricing for schools i was looking at that's about the same price as a Yamaha baritone sax, you know, student or intermediate model. There, you know, at that price, there's no no real reason that even high schools should not have a bass sax. Absolutely. With that instrument, 
I tried online to find some reviews, but I couldn't really find anything substantial. A couple of good reviews. Um, have you found anything, any further information about it, Brett? Uh, I have found so, some reviews of it, and everything I say, I've seen says it's a pretty good quality instrument. There are evidently two manufacturers in China uh, making uh, reproduction-based saxophones. One is a reproduction of the old vintage Kahn and Bushers. Uh, that's not the one that, that Wessex carries. The other is uh, the reproduction Selmer. And hands down, everybody says, get the reproduction Selmer. The the reproduction um, Con Busher has some some big intonation issues. But the, the reproduction Selmer, the, the one out of the Jin Bao factory, the Wessex instrument, that instrument is supposed to be actually very good. And again, under $5,000. Well, at that point, there's no reason to not get one. Like, it's expensive, relatively speaking, but in the grand scheme of wind instruments, that's almost nothing. Yeah, it really is. I mean, that's that's less than the price of my professional bassoon. That's less than the price of a professional bass clarinet. So, Wessex and Eppelsheim all the way. I'm certain that in a comparison between those instruments, the uh, Wessex is found wanting but oh yeah if it holds up with with the Eppelsheim, you've got a, a far superior instrument mechanically all the way around you know and Eppelsheim will do an instrument custom to low a as well and that's another thing i'd like to talk about low a's uh, a couple bass saxophones ha- have been produced with low a's i wish this note would become much more standard it would distance itself from the baritone sax a little bit more and it'd give you a nice low G as the low note instead of uh, this curious low A flat that we've got. Oh, yes. Well, I remember one band director I talked to in Indiana about the saxophone was like, why would I need it? It only gives me four extra notes. And, and th- therein is a, a huge issue. It really does only give you four semitones below a low A berry sax. It gives you a B, B flat, A, and A flat. And if it's only giving you four extra semitones, is it really worth it? Yes, it's a, a little bit lower. It's a slightly darker color. Uh, but are four extra semitones worth it? Uh, to me, yes, I want that darker color. To uh, a band director who doesn't care as much, maybe not. Yes, and I'm firmly in favor of low A's. So Eppelsheim will make them custom with low A's? Yes, I've, I've seen uh, several instruments of his, uh, maybe just one instrument, but I know he's done it uh, at least once or twice. That to, Yeah, I'll, we'll do a low A. Now, of course, that's going to raise up the price, but you get what you pay for. Yes, and that makes it distinctly a half contra, reaching all the way down to G1. Right. That gives it a... Well, at that point, the contralto only has a semitone on it, you know? Contralto clarinet. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think that should be another good trend that begins. All saxophones should start being made with low A as a standard note. It makes more sense than concert D-flat or concert A-flat, because then you have C or G. Yeah, and, and today we've only got the baritone sax being produced to low A. Um Selmer did a few altos with low A's. And I've heard of some conversions of sopranos to low A. And actually, uh, straight soprano and straight sopranino, they can be converted to low A's because it's not as, as mechanically difficult to add a low A to the straight instruments as it is to the curved instruments. You know, I've thought about taking my sopranino and if I were skilled enough, adding a, a low A onto it. But that's way down the road, learning um, you know, the entire craft of metallurgy. Well, speaking of personal additions, like Lone, the Lone Star Wind Orchestra's principal uh, saxophonist, got his, he sent his soprano to uh, Eppelsheim in Germany and had an extension added to low A. So now he can play uh, violin solos pretty comfortably because that gives him a low concert G. Right, and that see, for soprano, it really makes sense to have a low A on the instrument. Absolutely. And the saxophone, kind of like the clarinet, they're very open 
to uh, additions being made, extra keys, extra trills. So Loe's standard just makes a lot more sense. Oh, yeah. Then, then the alto suddenly has the same range as the viola. The tenor saxophone has a little bit more of a usable lower range and is better for reinforcement. The Barry already has one. The bass becomes a stronger bass instrument. And the contrabass, the Eppelstein contrabass, has it as well. So they have the low A already built in. Beautiful, brilliant. And the Sopranina would go down to C now, so it could cover flute music. Yes, yes. Though you did demonstrate that it can be uh, knee-muted fairly easily. Yeah, but that's that's treacherous. Very much so. Well, and then you can play that entire Bolero excerpt without doing that, if it has a low A. Right, and so if you had had a low A, you could actually play the whole bolero on the sopranino. Yes, by the way, I think your sopranino may be the very best of your saxes, because it just sounds so good, man. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure yet. Um, you know, I, I'm really liking my new soprano. Um, my alto still needs more work to it. Uh, I've got to take it back to another shop to get more work done on it. All right, so let's uh, look at wrapping some stuff up here. Any final thoughts on the bass saxophone, Matt? Well, it's a neglected instrument that I firmly believe needs to be brought back into the band. It has an incredible role it can play, as long as imaginative composers write for it. It doesn't just have to be a bass instrument. It's an instrument with its own unique tone color that you can usually recognize pretty carefully. I'm sorry, pretty readily when you compare it to a baritone saxophone or any other saxophone. And given the costs of both the Eppelsheim, which is reasonable, and then the Wessex, which is really low, there's no real fiscal reason other than being a band cheapskate not to bring the instrument into the fold of uh, our uh, wind bands. Yeah, and... You know, I'll, I'll further this, you know, I've got uh, several good friends who are saxophonists, and uh, one I worked with this past year, you know, when I, I was a uh, uh, band director at the school, he's got saying, hey, when are you going to get a bass sax? When are you going to get a bass sax? So, and the guy's a monster saxophone player, and he realizes that, yeah, bass saxophones are worth it. You know, these, these instruments are needed. They're great for... Um, you know, Dixieland jazz, where they're used all over the place. And a lot of the great uh, band literature has bass saxophone parts in it. So again, a, a neglected instrument, you know, yes, they're expensive, but you buy one. You know, remember, the, the bass saxophones that I used in undergrad and grad school were are probably 90 years old now. They last a long time. Yes, I was very upset um, at my undergrad. The semester before I got there, I learned the old director, who was uh, promptly fired, uh, sold the school's bass saxophone, it was a Selmer, to get two uh, crappy three-valve B-flat tubas. You're shitting me. No, he actually did. What? Oh, God. There's a reason he was fired, man. Oh, okay. Um, on that morbid note, oh, I think that probably just about sums it up for bass saxophone. Um, do you have any news performances, Matt? I know you have a performance tomorrow night, don't you? We're recording this on Sunday the 17th of July. Yes, I've uh, started a series where I'm playing at a... Uh small Italian eatery in Richardson, Texas, called Marcus Cafe, every Monday for the next month from 7 to 9. I'm performing on clarinet, flute, saxophone, and a little bassoon here and there. I'm playing uh, pop tunes, jazz tunes. Well, keep in mind, pop tunes before they started becoming really crappy. Um, if you're in the area, please come out and support. It'll be fun, and I take requests. Uh, other than that, I've been making a lot of bassoon uh, transcription quartet music yeah actually i i'm really thinking about uh, heading out to see you tomorrow night so i will probably make that drive out there oh man i would appreciate that brett oh yeah um 
Uh, for me, uh, I am hard at work right now on uh, working on my band piece, The Forest of Dreams. I've written quite extensively on it the last uh, week or so. Um, one thing I really do want to push, though, is I have just put out a GoFundMe campaign so that I can uh, help help me finish the textbook I'm writing, the, the course in band orchestration. This is to help me finish volume one. Volume one will cover the orchestration aspects. The The goal will be a three volume series, one on orchestration, one on instrumentation, and one on special problems in the band. I just put that campaign up live last night. I've already had uh, some donors to it. Um, if you could help out at all, that's fantastic. There's all sorts of levels you can donate at and all sorts of rewards that I've got there. Every little bit helps and I really want to be able to make that uh, course in band orchestration reality, put it out as a real book that you can have in your hands. Yes, I fully endorse the GoFundMe. Uh, once I have a couple of more shillings to my name, I'd happily contribute to you, Brett. <laughs> ah, no, no worries there. You're doing your part. Um, aside from that, I've published a few articles on band orchestration of the last week, uh, some more articles in the course on band orchestration. Go check those out. Um, this podcast will be made live within the next few days. Uh, it should be showing up now on iTunes. If it's not, um, just, uh, write a comment in the comment section on bandestration.com and I'll see what I can do to take care of it. And please, by all means, give us feedback. Make requests, ask questions. We do love answering those, right, Brett? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And for the people who have asked for an episode on the piccolo oboe, it's coming. It's just one of the most difficult instruments to research. And there's uh, right now I just don't have enough information to, to fill out a full episode. We'll talk about it at some point, though. It is coming for those of you who want the episode on the piccolo oboe. You know, Brett, I'd bet you money there's not a piccolo oboe in Texas. <laughs> uh, probably not, but you never know. That's true. That's true. All right. Well, at any rate, I think that's um, about it for today. And we'll get uh, this up online soon. And until next time, I'm Brett Newton from Bandistration.com. And I'm Matthew Banks. And we'll see you next time.